Good afternoon and welcome to our Neuroscience Lecture Series. I am Dr. Gawad Hakim, Assistant Vice President of International Healthcare Partnerships and Insurance Development at Baptist Health International. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this informative presentation. I would like to extend warm greetings to our friends across Latin America, the Caribbean, and everyone joining us today. During this interactive presentation, you'll have the ability to ask questions via the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen. I will be your moderator for today's lecture. Before I continue, let me just uh, make sure I uh, stand corrected. Uh, you are in uh, today's uh, Miami Cancer Institute Cancer Lecture Series. Um, I will be, again, your moderator this afternoon, so bear with us, please. I have the pleasure of introducing to you our good friend, Dr. Srikanth Nagala, uh, who we very fondly uh, call him Dr. Sri Nagala. His presentation is titled, An Approach to Hemostasis and Thrombosis uh, for the Internist. Dr. Nagala is a Chief Benign Hematology at Baptist Health Miami Cancer Institute. He is a board certified in internal medicine, oncology, and hematology. He specializes in treating benign non-cancerous hematological conditions, including bleeding and clotting, clotting disorders, red blood disorders, of course, and uh, high and low platelets and uh, high and low blood counts, bone marrow failure syndromes, myeloproliferative neoplasms, among many other conditions. Dr. Nagala received his medical training at Madras Medical College in uh, Chennai, India. He completed his residency in internal medicine at the University of North Dakota in Fargo, North Dakota, and followed by a fellowship in medical oncology at the Drexel University College of Medicine in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and a fellowship in hematology at St. Thomas Jefferson University Hospital, also in Philadelphia. Dr. Nagala joined the Miami Cancer Institute from the University of Texas, uh, from the University of Texas. And uh, of course, Dr. Nag Nagala is a member of several professional associations, including the American Society of Hematology and the American College of Physicians. Please let's give a warm welcome to our friend, Dr. Nagala. Dr. Nagala, what a pleasure having you. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Thank you for the kind introduction, Dr. Hakim, and welcome everyone. And I hope uh, everyone can hear me well and see the slides. So today we'll be talking about an approach to hemostasis and thrombosis. And it's mainly for the internists, but of course, if some of you are in hematology and oncology, I think uh, it would be useful refresher and you're always welcome to ask questions and I can expand on some of these things towards the end. So the learning objectives is to understand the basics of uh, primary and secondary hemostasis, understand the tests used to evaluate hemostasis, learn the approach to a prolonged prothrombin time and APTT, which is activated partial thromboplastin time, and learn the approach to thrombocytopenia and basics of ITP, which is immune thrombocytopenia, TTP, which is thrombotic thrombocytopenic pur purpura, and then heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. And also we'll try to understand the basics of hypercoagulability testing and learn the approach to the duration of anticoagulation question. Okay, so the major components of hemostasis, if you look at them, uh, you have um, the blood vessel, and then you have the connective tissue, which has the collagen. And then of course you have uh, the von Willebrand uh, factor. So whenever you cut yourself, there's always some ways of constriction, there's plated activation when the platelets come in contact with collagen, which is the connective tissue. And then of course, the von Willebrand factor is released from the Weibel Pilardi bodies. And that also causes platelet activation and you get a platelet plug formation. Subsequently, you have the activation of the coagulation cascade with the tissue factor that's released. And then finally, the fibrinogen is converted to fibrin and you form a stable clot because the platelets are already in place with fibrinogen in between them. And then on top of that, you're converting this fibrinogen to fibrin clot with secondary hemostasis, and that forms the stable clot. So primary hemostasis involves the blood vessels, the connective tissue, uh, of course, the monolibrin uh, factor, and then the platelets. Okay, so that's the primary hemostasis. So defects in these components leads to primary hemostatic defects. Secondary hemostasis means you're talking about 
coagulation factor deficiencies like your hemophilia A factor 8 deficiency, hemophilia B factor 9 deficiency. So all these coagulation factor deficiencies, fibrinogen deficiency, all these things come under secondary hemostasis. Okay, so disorders of primary hemostasis versus secondary hemostasis. So how do you recognize this in your practice? How do you know, okay, this could be a problem with primary hemostasis, which is a platelet disorder or a von Lubrin factor problem or a collagen problem versus coagulation factor problem, which is secondary hemostasis. So if you have easy bruising, gum bleeding, epistaxis, menorrhagia, okay, so mucocutaneous bleeding. If it's mucocutaneous bleeding, think about primary hemostasis. If you have joint bleeds or deep muscle bleeds, like muscles, uh, hematomas, intramuscular hematomas. So those things, you think about coagulation factor defects. Of course, I always get the question, how about brain bleeds? Brain bleeds can occur either in primary hemostasis or in secondary hemostasis defects. So they count under both. So what do you do briefly to evaluate hemostasis? A patient is referred to you. What are you thinking through? First thing is, of course, I want to make sure that I briefly evaluate the primary hemostasis, then the secondary hemostasis. So I think about platelets, right? So the three components I said are platelets, connective tissue, von Lubrin factor. Of course, it's tough to assess the blood vessel and all those things with blood tests because you're not taking out the blood vessel, you're not taking out the collagen. So what are the tests that you can do with the blood? Of course, you think of platelets and then assess von Lubrin factor. So platelets, it's both the quantity. Does the patient have low platelets? Oh, this could be ITP or something else going on. Platelet number is fine. Quality, a lot of times it's the acquired platelet dysfunction due to aspirin, due to clopidogrel, due to sometimes uremia, right? Like people with end-stage kidney disease have uremia that can also affect platelets. And then any congenital platelet defects, right? Because people can have... Uh, bernard Soulier syndrome, Glanzmann's thrombosthenia. So all those things are platelet problems. And then you assess von Lubrin factor. How do you assess the von Lubrin factor? Uh, you can get the ristocytin or von Lubrin activity. You can get the antigen, and then you can get a factor eight level. So there, those are the tests you do for assessing von Lubrin factor. And then of course, for the secondary hemostasis, you look at the PT and INR, you get the APTT, and then you can get a thrombin time. The thrombin time is evaluating the last section, which is fibrinogen being converted to fibrin. So if you look at this, this is a, a, a representation of our uh, coagulation cascade. So you can see there's the extrinsic pathway, then there's this intrinsic pathway. And uh, uh, the extrinsic pathway, you have this factor seven. And then intrinsic pathway, you have 12, 11, 9, and then 8. And then they both meet at factor 10. And then you have factor 5. And then this is prothrombin, which is factor 2, that gets converted to thrombin. And finally, you have fibrinogen forming fibrin, which is the clot. So if you have a PT, PTT, and thrombin time, and how do you look at these things, then how do you evaluate these things. So if you have a PT only prolongation or a PTT only prolongation, then what does it mean? Or if you have both of them prolonged. So PT evaluates the extrinsic pathway, the APTT evaluates the intrinsic pathway. So both these pathways meet at 10. So you have 10 problem or factor 5 problem or prothrombin problem or fibrinogen problem, both PT and PTT are prolonged because this is the common pathway. If you just say only PT is prolonged, PTT is completely normal, then you're talking about factor seven, okay? Because PTT is not prolonged, so it's not hitting the common pathway yet. So you're just talking about factor seven deficiency. If only APTT is prolonged and PT is normal, then you're looking at factor 12, factor 11, factor 9, and then factor 8 deficiencies. So this is how you interpret prolonged PT, prolonged APTT, or if both of them are prolonged. The thrombin time is nothing but you take plasma and you add thrombin into the tube, and it's only working at the level of the fibrinogen. That's it. So if a thrombin time is prolonged, you're talking about a fibrinogen problem or sometimes too much D-dimer or breakdown products of fibrin. Okay, so 
thrombin time is only evaluating this, which means if you have a factor eight deficiency or whatever about this, it's not going to affect the thrombin time. So interpretation of clotting times, which I just mentioned, if you only have prolonged PT and APTT is normal, thrombin time is normal, then it's factor seven is low. Okay, that's all the way at the top of the extrinsic uh, pathway. If you have prolonged APTT, but the other two are normal, then you may think about factor 12, factor nine, factor 11, and eight. If both of them are prolonged, but thrombin time is still normal, then this is the common pathway, which is factor five, factor 10, and factor two, which is prothrombin. And then if you have thrombin time also prolonged and you can have PT and PTT normal or prolonged, then this could be a low fibrinogen or even thrombin inhibitors. What are some of the thrombin inhibitors? Like you can have ergetroban, which is an infusion, or you have Pradaxa here in the US or Dabigatran, which is a direct thrombin inhibitor. Uh, heparin is also a thrombin inhibitor. It acts through antithrombin. So that's how you interpret these clotting times. So if you have some 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 of the uh, some some of the key points, how do anticoagulants affect this? How do anticoagulants affect this? If it's heparin, only the APTT is prolonged. If it's inoxaparin, what is inoxaparin? It's a low molecular weight heparin. It's normal APTT and PT. Okay, none of them are prolonged with inoxaparin. Okay. None of them are prolonged due to the smaller size of the uh, molecule. None of them are prolonged. Uh, rivaroxaban and apixaban, remember, so these are the direct oral anticoagulants. Rivarox, the newer ones, not new anymore, but rivaroxaban and apixaban. PT can be prolonged. Okay, it happens more with the rivaroxaban than apixaban. So PT can be prolonged, INR can be prolonged, but you don't use INR for this because INR is specifically used to monitor warfarin or coumadin. You're not using INR to be monitoring all these things. So a lot of times people may come into the hospital on rivaroxaban or apixaban, their INR may be two or three. First of all, you shouldn't be talking about INR, but let's say you look at it and it's two or three. And then people are suddenly, oh, maybe I have to reverse it. No, don't do anything. Even INR sometimes can be five or six on these agents. It means nothing. It doesn't tell you that this patient is supratherapeutic because the test is not designed for this and PT INRs are prolonged with rivaroxaban and apixaban. Please leave them alone, nothing to do. Uh, just continue the drug because they're on it for AFib or a clot. Dabigatran, APTT is more affected, but thrombin time is also prolonged because dabigatran is a direct thrombin inhibitor. Warfarin increases PT INR. APTT is also increased. Why is that? Because warfarin acts through the vitamin K. It's a vitamin K antagonist. So it affects gamma carboxylation of vitamin K dependent factors. So what are the vitamin, vitamin K dependent factors? 2, 7, 9, 10, protein C, protein S. So 2, 7, 9, 10. Out of these 2, 7, 9, 10, 2 and 10 are common pathway uh, factors and 9 is an intrinsic uh, pathway factor. So that's why PTT can be prolonged with warfarin. Not only PTINR, but PTT can be prolonged. Okay, you have an isolated APTT prolongation. So patient comes to your clinic, APTT is prolonged. You need to work it up. So people are asking you, okay, why is this PTT prolonged? So first thing, you need to always see if the patient is bleeding or not. If the patient is bleeding, of course, this could be a problem because this patient may have a factor deficiency or a factor inhibitor. Patient is not bleeding, this could be a lupus anticoagulant or something, but how do you work it up? You start with the PTT mixing study, meaning you do a one is to one mix. So you take the patient's plasma and you mix it with a normal plasma. So let's say you take one ml of this and one ml of this, just an example, okay? Then you're looking for the correction. You're looking for the correction because the mixing study is based on a principle that you only need 30 to 50% of any factor with your reagents to give you a normal PT or PTT. Okay, you only need 30 to 50%. So let's say a patient has got deficiency of a factor. So let's say the factor deficiency is 1%, 2%. But when you do a one is to one mix, the normal plasma is supposed to have 100%. So what is the average always going to be? The average will be at least 50% or above 40% all the time if it's a factor deficiency. So that's why if the mixing study corrects the PTT or the PT, 
that is a factor deficiency. Let's say the mixing study is not correcting. You're doing a one is to one mix, but it does not correct. So, which means there is something in the patient's plasma that is inhibiting also the normal plasma factor. Okay. So what could be there? You could be a drug. It could be a heparin. It could be a piximan. It could be rivaroxaban that's inhibiting the factors in the patients in the normal plasma also. It could be real factor inhibitors. Patients develop factor eight inhibitors sometimes, right? So you have a prolonged PTT, patient is bleeding, it's not correcting. This could be a factor eight inhibitor. Of course, a lupus anticoagulant, which is part of the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome workup, that could also cause a prolonged PTT and that doesn't correct on mixing because it's an inhibitor, but these patients don't bleed, right? They clot. So, and the most important thing in this is, yes, you need to work it up, but please see is the patient bleeding or not bleeding. If the patient is obviously bleeding, then this could be a factor inhibitor, okay? Or if the patient is not bleeding, then this could be a lupus anticoagulant. Okay, so that's the difference. So you have to look at the clinical picture. Moving on. Okay, this is going to be just we're touching on different aspects of hemostasis. It's not going to be a detailed talk on one particular issue, just so that people can get a broader knowledge. Okay, platelet disorders. So first, let's talk about qualitative platelet disorders. Okay, so see... The primary hemostatic problems, which is platelets, von Willebrand factor, or connective tissue problems, you are not touching the coagulation cascade. This is before the coagulation cascade, which means you are going to have a normal PT and PTT, normal thrombin time. PT and PTT are prolonged only if you have coagulation factor defects like we just discussed. So if you have a platelet problem, you will have a normal PT and PTT. But what can what would be prolonged is something called as a bleeding time. We don't do it. Like 85 to 90% of the North American uh, hemophilia treatment centers no longer do a bleeding time. It's done by putting a blood pressure cuff, inflating it to 40 millimeters of mercury, making an incision in the forearm, looking to see how long the patient is bleeding, using a blotting paper at the side, we don't do that because it's not very reliable. It depends upon how deep you are putting your uh, instrument to cut the patient's skin. So, so many things. It depends upon so many other factors. It's got a lot of uh, uh, operator variability. But in your, if somebody is taking an exam question or you're doing your test, of course, when they say prolonged bleeding time, the clue is towards a primary hemostatic defect like a platelet disorder. And these patients have mucocutaneous bleeding. And of course, they also have abnormal platelet aggregation. So you do this testing where platelets are tested to see if they're coming together with fibrinogen in a, in a small cuet. And if that is abnormally prolonged, that is called abnormal platelet aggregation. And that is a, a hallmark of the platelet disorders. So some of these disorders are Glanzmann's thrombasthenia, where you have this defect in this receptor called GP2B3A, where fibrinogen has to bind. You can have a Bernard Soulier syndrome, uh, where it's the GP1B um, uh, problem on the platelet, uh, where it binds to uh, one librin factor. And then you can also have sometimes one librin disease with one librin factor deficiency. Okay. And then you have antiplatelet therapy that could also cause problems with your primary hemostasis. The and, and these are sometimes tested on the boards, or if there are any medical students listening to this talk, they're tested on your um, um, exams, USMLE, and any other testing. So aspirin. So you have aspirin, which is a classical one, which inhibits the COX-1. COX is nothing but cyclooxygenase. So cyclooxygenase is converting arachidonic acid to thromboxane A2, and aspirin inhibits that. And because of that, you don't have thromboxane A2, one of the platelet agonists needed for platelet aggregation. So because of that, you can have a bleeding. But more importantly, you're trying to prevent spontaneous uh, platelet aggregation in MI, in heart attack patients, in stroke patients, and everything. The next class of agents are called the P2Y12 antagonists. Okay, so this this is a question that they ask all the time if you're taking, if it's a medical student or even on the board, you need to know what is the mechanism of action of these antiplatelet therapy. So aspirin is a COX inhibitor 
And then there are P2Y12 antagonists. So P2Y12 is a receptor on the platelet where ADP um, works and then it causes platelet activation. So P2Y12 antagonists are your clopidogrel, prosogrel, ticagrelor, all these things inhibit the P2Y12. Okay, in that way, they're also antiplatelet therapy. And of course, if you're going to put a stent in a patient's uh, um, coronary artery or something, you want to use agents that block the terminal receptor on the platelet, which is nothing but the GP2B3A. Okay, and then there are GP2B3 inhibitors like apsiximab, eptifibatide, and pirofiban. And then there's a newer, one more agent called Vorapaxor, which is a thrombin receptor inhibitor, which is the PAR1 or protease activated receptor uh, or um, one uh, inhibitor. So these are all the plated drugs that also cause bleeding if a uh, patient um, uh, is um, having excess plated inhibition. Okay. Now, moving on from qualitative problems to quantitative problems of platelets. So thrombocytopenia, which is low platelet count. So what are some of the common non-autoimmune causes of thrombocytopenia? The first thing to recognize is pseudothrombocytopenia. Okay. So just seeing if, uh, yeah, I think we're going to talk about it. So I don't want to jump into it right now. So first is called the pseudothrombocytopenia. Then you have disorders of decreased platelet production, like certain viral infections, um, uh, congenital thrombocytopenias, alcohol. So if people binge drink alcohol, you can see that they come in with a low platelet count and then you keep them for DTs in the hospital for seven days or five days, they rebound, okay? From being at 30,000 platelets, they can go up to 500, 600,000 platelets. They overshoot and then they come back to normal. So alcohol, alcohol causes direct megakerocyte. Megakerocyte is the... Uh, is the cell that produces platelets from the bone marrow. It causes direct toxicity of the megakaryocyte. Of course, alcohol can also cause folate deficiency, vitamin B12 deficiency, because you're not eating properly. That can also cause platelet production defects. Of course, alcohol can also cause cirrhosis of the liver, portal hypertension, and then hypersplenism, splenomegaly, that can also cause pancytopenias and cytopenias. So there are different ways how alcohol can cause low platelets then you can have bone marrow disorder. So these are all decreased platelet production. Sometimes it's decreased platelet survival, like drugs, um, um, DIC, TTP, HUS, and then you have dilutional thrombocytopenia can happen. And then splenic sequestration, for example, spleen is infiltrated with something, there's portal hypertension uh, that could also be causing splenic sequestration, okay? So first question to ask, if the patient comes with low platelets. Is this isolated low platelet count? I mean, is only a platelet being affected or uh, is, is platelet is the only thing that is it being affected or is it affecting, um, is it affecting uh, the, um, um, uh, is it affecting uh, the white cells or the red blood cells? Um, I'm just sorry. Is my video seen or I, I think my... Your your video is off, Dr. Shri. I don't know if uh, you meant it uh, that way, but... Uh, no, so, okay, sorry about you're that. Back. Yeah, now you're back. I just realized. Okay, sorry about that. So, so, so if you... So the first question to ask is, is this isolated thrombocytopenia? And if it is not, if there is anemia or pancytopenia or other things, then you're thinking about... Uh, you're thinking about uh, a bone marrow. You're thinking about bone marrow problems and you're thinking about maybe a sequestration in the liver. So pancytopenia could mean bone marrow pathology, but first evaluate for splenomegaly. So before thinking about going to the bone marrow, think about splenomegaly. So it's a very simple thing. Just examine the patient, see if the patient has a large spleen that could account for your cytopenias. Okay. Next, pseudothrombocytopenia. If this is an isolated platelet count problem, please don't jump to conclusion, say, oh, this could be ITP, this could be something bad with the platelets. The first simplest thing is platelet clumping, which is called pseudothrombocytopenia. It's platelet clumping. So you can do one of two things. Go and look at the peripheral blood smear and you look for these platelet clumps, or you can ask them to repeat your platelet count in a citrate or a heparin tube. Normally we do a CDC in an EDTA tube, which is a purple top tube. Okay, you ask them, or lavender top tube, 
you do it in a blue top tube, then that is the uh, citrate tube or the heparin um, tube, which is green top. And if you have pseudothrombocytopenia, that hopefully corrects it. There are some clumping that happens even in citrate tubes. So that's why you have to look at the peripheral blood smear. This is thought to result from naturally occurring anti uh, platelet autoantibody that's directed against um, a concealed epitope on platelet membrane glycoprotein, uh, GP2B3A, that becomes exposed when the EDTA uh, induces the dissociation of the GP2B3, meaning some of them already have these antibodies, but in the presence of the EDTA outside the body, this antigen gets exposed kind of from the result so that then the antibodies recognize that particular epitope and cause the platelet aggregate, platelet clumping, okay? Uh, this doesn't happen in the body. It's not something that's happening in vivo. This is an uh, in vitro thing, okay? This is uh, not an in vivo phenomenon. Okay, if it's an isolated thrombocytopenia, the biggest, con or if it's thrombocytopenia, if you're in the hospital or you're taking care of patient, what are you really concerned about? You have to be concerned about, is this ITP, immune thrombocytopenia? Is this TTP, which is thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura? Or is this HIT, which is heparin-induced thrombocytopenia? So because these three are the ones where the patient can have a lot of morbidity and mortality if you do not pick these conditions in a timely manner. So each one has different treatments. So that's the reason you have to pay attention to these things. Okay, first let's talk about ITP. So what is ITP? ITP is nothing but patient has antibodies against the platelets, okay? They have antibodies. It's an autoimmune phenomenon of antibodies against the platelets. So, which means you get uh, immune-mediated destruction of platelets, and sometimes there is inadequate compensatory response from the bone marrow, though the platelets are being destroyed. In children, it's usually self-limited after a viral infection, but in adults, most of these ITPs that are acute go on to become chronic, with relapses and remissions in between. Okay, it's characterized as an autoimmune mediated platelet destruction with some degree of decreased platelet production. I mean, the reason this is important to remember is because we use thrombopoietin receptor agonists. We use thrombopoietin mimetics like l thrombopag romiplostim, all these things go to the bone marrow and increase the production. Okay, so there's definitely some impaired thrombopoiesis. These increase the production and they compensate for the destruction. And then by that, you have a higher platelet count. Unfortunately, ITP is a disease of exclusion. Disease of exclusion is always difficult to diagnose because you need to exclude everything else. Oh, hemoglobin, normal. White count, normal, good. Hemoglobin can be low because some ITP patients, women can have increased blood loss with menstrual cycles and they can come in with iron deficiency anemia along with ITP, okay? So just don't say that, oh, the hemoglobin is low, so this cannot be ITP. It can be ITP, provided that hemoglobin is accounted for due to chronic bleeding or something like that. Patients present with isolated thrombocytopenia, this is, but still it's easy to diagnose because a patient coming with petechiae, okay, patient coming in regularly for a hospital to a procedure and it's 30,000 platelets, everything is normal, think of pseudothrombocytopenia, the platelet clumping. But patient coming in 3,000, 4,000, to the hospital, to the ED with petechiae, with bruising, of course, that's not pseudothrombocytopenia. That is real. That is so you think about ITP. And it could be primary or secondary, meaning there's a cause or you don't know the cause. Um, um, so this is what happens. You have platelets and against which there are antibodies. And then these are being coated with antibodies. And then you go to the spleen or the liver or the bone marrow and the spleen they have these macrophages, the reticuloendothelial system. And if you still remember the structure of your antibodies, so you have this V portion of this Y, which is called the FAV portion. And the stock of the Y is the uh, FC portion. So the macrophages have FC receptors. So you see this FC portion of the antibody it goes and docks into the FC receptor, and then the macrophage is destroying the platelets. So that's how platelets get destroyed in ITP. So you have antibodies directed and then the FC portion goes and docks into the FC receptor of the macrophage in the spleen or the liver and then the platelets get destroyed, okay? Some, this is just a slide I like to show because this is a question we always get, right? Okay, what platelet count do I need for this procedure? 
nobody knows you can do it at any thing because in united states we have a different thing uh, depending upon the medical legal situation of a country people have different things uh, there are other countries where we don't follow these strict rules like this but the general expert opinion is if you need a major neurosurgery usually keep it greater than 100000 platelets if it's a major surgery like orthopedics or cardiothoracic 75 to 80000 uh, let's say it's like colonoscopy, inguinal hernia repair, 50,000. If you just need like oral dental extractions or regional dental block, then it's be 30,000 or so. If it's a complex multiple teeth removals, 50,000. So this is just a slide that you guys can, uh, you can have it just in case uh, uh, you need some guidance on what platelet counts for different procedures. Okay. So what is the another diagnosis of immediate concern? The another diagnosis of immediate concern is microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, like TTP kind of a thing. So patients can come with this maha with concomitant neurological issues. So what is maha? So basically, you have platelets that could form microthrombi due to a reason I'll tell you. And then you form these microthrombi in blood vessels, and then the red blood cells are trying to traverse these microthrombi, the nets of these microthrombi, and then these red blood cells can get destroyed, and that can cause uh, schistocyte formation because they are fragmented red cells, but that also uh, causes hemolysis, right? This is due to the mechanical injury of red cells. And that is a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia because it takes place in small blood vessels with microthrombi. That's why it's microangiopathic. It's hemolytic anemia because it's a destruction. Or it's not an immune mediated phenomenon, it's a mechanical destruction. So these are all the various causes of why ma maha can happen. The biggest thing is TTP, which is thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. And of course, you have HUS, hemolytic uremic syndrome, or atypical HUS, and then you have these. Uh, cancers, DIC, uh, uh, hit uh, like bad health syndrome um, uh, in, in pregnancy, all these things can cause uh, microthrombi and then shearing. Okay. So TTP is due to a deficiency. It could be acquired deficiency due to autoantibodies or you're born deficient, hereditary, in an enzyme called ADMTS13. ADMTS13, this is the long form of that, but you need to know what ADMTS13 does. It is a von Willebrand factor cleaving protease. So what is that? When we form von Willebrand, when von Willebrand factor is coming out, when it's being produced, it comes out as ultra large multimers. Okay, it comes out as ultra large multimers. So this ADMTS13 enzyme clips them into an adequate size things and packages them. Okay, so if you don't have ADMTS13, then these ultra large multiples of von Willebrand factor, they just stay as ultra large multimers. Because of that, the platelet, I told you the platelets have GP1B receptors, so they can stick to von Willebrand factor. And that's how platelets come when you cut yourself and then they stick because of von Willebrand factor and the thing. But now let's say you have this super sticky ultra large multimer um, thing, then you have a lot of platelets sticking to that. And that causes these microthrombi, this causes the microthrombi because of this platelet sticking. That's what causes TTP. Okay, that's what causes TTP. And then you see these, um, you see these uh, fragmented red cells because the red cells are trying to go through these microthrombi and they get sheared. These are called schistocytes. These are the fragments. Okay, the ones that don't look spherical. Differential diagnosis of Thrombotic microangiopathy could be TTP, HUS, which is hemolytic uremic syndrome. People can eat a tainted burger or a salad and get O157, H57, E. coli strain that causes hemolytic uremic syndrome, disseminated intravascular coagulation, malignant hypertension, vasculitis, SLE, all these things are causes of uh, TMA, okay, thrombotic microangiopathy. So, you can have ischemic organ damage and you can get microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. So either an organ is damaged, like you can have brain or kidneys that are affected, like in TTP, more of a brain than kidneys. And then you can have this hemolytic anemia picture. Okay. How do you, how do you uh, uh, diagnose these things? On the blood, 
you can have elevated LDH due to organ damage, ischemic organ damage, but generally in the blood things, you're looking for high LDH and low haptoglobin because that indicates hemolysis, right? And then the Coombs test is, of course, negative because the direct Coombs or the direct antiglobulin test is negative because it's not an immune phenomenon. You have a high reticulocyte count because it's hemolysis and you're trying to compensate and you have uh, in elevated indirect bilirubin. DAT stands for antiglobulin test, which is the direct Coombs test, which is, um, 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 which is negative in this patient. So, okay, those are the schistocytes. If there's a suspicion for TTP, um, please review the smear and everything. Send off the RMTS 13 level and arrange for plasma exchange. Okay, arrange for plasma exchange. Uh, there are newer, there's one more drug called caplisuzumab, which we use now, but but this is the basic plasma exchange, plasma exchange, plasma exchange. That's the most important treatment for TTP. Then moving on to heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, right? So heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is uh, you're giving a heparin product and then the patient develops antibodies against the heparin PF4 complex. Okay, heparin and platelet factor 4 complex. And it's a hypercognitive state that destroys platelets because these antibodies are directed against platelets. It destroys the platelets. You have thrombocytopenia. So people may say, oh, the patient is at risk of bleeding. No, no, no. These patients are not at risk of bleeding. They're at risk of clotting. This is a hypercoagulable state. Okay, so you can't, uh, just because the platelets are low, you, you can't think that the patients don't clot. They do clot. Okay, and serious, and it's a potentially uh, very fatal drug of adverse event due to heparin you can see both arterial and venous clots. Okay, it's not just venous or it's not just arterial. You can see both. When do you suspect it? You start heparin and five to 10 days later, the platelets fall. There is new thrombosis or worsening clotting. Then you suspect that this could be hit. And this is the schematic representation of the hit IgG with platelets. Um, uh, basically, you have these uh, antibodies that are forming a bonus ag against this PF4 heparin complex and these antibodies, which I just said, right, FAB and the FC portion of the, the YFC portion, they go and dock in the FC receptors of platelets this time, okay, they go and dock in the FC receptor of platelets, not in the macrophages, in the platelets, so they activate platelets, they release microparticles, causing further thrombosis. Okay, so that's the pathogenesis of HIT. Um, estimation, so how do you say, could this be HIT or not pretest? You look at the four Ts, Warkentin's four Ts, thrombocytopenia, timing of the thrombocytopenia, thrombosis, and are there other causes for platelet fall? Okay, so you give points for all these things. It's there in all your books and everything, so it's easily found online, the four P scoring, and based on that, you can give the points and then you can say, oh, this is low probability if it's only zero to three score or intermediate probability or high probability. If it's low, you don't need to send testing, but for intermediate and high, you confirm by sending testing. What do you do? You stop heparin, you switch to alternative anticoagulants. Don't use lovinox or enoxheparin because enoxheparin, anything that ends with an erin is a heparin. So whether it's enoxaparin, daltaparin, anything, it's a heparin. The only things you can use are alternative anticoagulants like fondoparinex, or you can use argetproban, those things. Okay, and don't use warfarin either because warfarin also can cause hypercoagulability initially. Don't transfuse platelets. Okay, even if the platelet count is 20,000, give them anticoagulation. Don't transfuse platelets. And of course, test for the HIT antibodies, the ELISA or the serotonin release assay and get an ultrasound of the extremities to look for any clots, okay? So that's the platelet disorders. Let's quickly move on to thrombophilia testing. So the common lab, what is thrombophilia? Thrombophilia is the hypercoagulability tests. Okay, patient comes with a clot. What is the cause of that? Okay, let's test for some of these things to find out the cause. I mean, they may or may not help, but what are the common tests? You have inherited genetic tests like factor V laden, prothrombin gene mutation, or you have functional assays like antithrombin level, protein C level, protein S level. And then you have acquired testing for APLS or antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, which includes the lupus anticoagulant testing, anti cardiolipin antibodies, anti beta 2 glycoprotein antibodies. So these are all the available classical hypercoagulability testing. What is the caveats in testing? 
you have decreased levels in acute thrombosis, liver disease, and DIC, for example, antithrombin, protein C, protein S, they're consumed. You have decreased levels with heparin use, like antithrombin is low. With warfarin use, you have protein C and S low. So you have to wait at least one week after stopping warfarin to really test these things. You can have false increase in clot-based protein C, protein S activities and antithrombin activities with the epixaban or rivaroxaban use. If you test it in pregnancy, the protein S can be low. You test it on hormonal therapy, contraceptives, the containing estrogen, protein S is low. So based on this, what we say is do not test when it's hospitalized in acute VTE because the reason is the patient has an acute thrombosis and you can have all these numbers being falsely low. So please don't test in acute uh, clotting situation. There are other testing people do homocysteine level. It's associated with VTE, but lowering the levels does not reduce the recurrence. Okay, so there's no point in testing. Factor 8, 9, 11, fibrinogen, they're all risk factors for the first clot, but not for recurrent clot. The patient is coming to you because the patient already had the clot. So that's why testing for these don't change. If the patient has an intra-abdominal thrombosis, but Chiari syndrome, or splenic vein thrombosis, mesenteric thrombosis, no cause for it. The patient doesn't have cirrhosis, the patient doesn't have abdominal infection, but comes with intra-abdominal thrombosis. Then if the CBC blood counts are normal or high, check for JAK2 for a myeloproliferative neoplasm. If the counts are low and you think there is some hemolysis, but the counts are low cytopenias, check for paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria with basically CD55 and CD59 flow cytometry for them, okay? Then you have plasminogen activator inhibitor, uh, tissue thromboplastin levels, uh, the plasminogen activator levels, polymorphisms of those. None of them have any clinical significance. Don't test them, okay? Don't test them. So don't test homocysteine. Don't test factor 8, factor 11 for clotting. Don't test these things. Only thing that's useful is JAK2 and CD5559 flow for PNH if there is the right like intra-abdominal thrombosis and stuff like that. These are slides that show that lowering homocysteine does not have any effect on arterial thrombosis. These are slides to show that lowering homocysteine does not have any effect on venous thrombosis recurrence. Okay. Then there are some other things like MTHF4 polymorphisms and homocysteine levels, which I just said. There is no association between MTHF4 polymorphisms and thrombosis. So please don't test for MTHF4 polymorphisms. Lowering homocysteine levels does not decrease the risk of, so don't test for homocysteine either. So there's no test, no, no reason to test these things. Whom do we test? If it's a provoked clot, meaning patient have a hip surgery, knee surgery, had a clot, don't test. Why? We know it's provoked due to that. Okay. Patient had pneumonia, was hospitalized, had a clot. Don't test. In unprovoked venous thromboembolic disease, you can test for counseling and management of an asymptomatic woman with a strong family history of VTE in a hormonal milieu setting. You could, you could kind of test these people. Patients with VTE and family history of thrombophilia, you could consider testing. Younger patients with recurrent unprovoked clots, you could uh, uh, test them. Patient personal preference, no matter what we explain, sometimes patients may say, doc, I just want to know, uh, can we please test them? Uh, it's okay, yeah, you wanna know, fine, we'll test it. So mostly these testing is not useful because it doesn't really help. Why does it not help? Because the treatment depends upon a clinical decision-making. Is it a provoked clot or an unprovoked clot? If it is provoked by surgery or other non-surgical transient risk factors, you give blood thinners for three months. If it's unprovoked, then you do it for three months. And if everything is good and the patient is not at risk of bleeding, you continue it more than that for extent. That's it. So you didn't use, if the patient have factor five, does the patient have prothrombin gene to make this decision? You said, is it provoked or unprovoked? That's it. So that is the reason testing all those things doesn't change your management, okay? And 
uh, inherited or acquired thrombophilia not considered in determining the duration. So that is the reason why most of the time this testing is not that helpful. I think I will stop there because uh, we can take some questions. Uh, but I know that it was very quick and uh, general uh, overview, uh, but I'm happy to take any questions. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so very much, Doctor. What a, I'm smiling because this is such an important refresher. I mean, you took me back to uh, hematology 101 and immunology. <laughs> what a complex subject. And we are so happy that it's you and not us. <laughs> who has to deal with all those incredibly complex algorithms, especially in anticoagulation and all the uh, factors that are involved in it. Um, before we answer, we have a couple of questions before we let you go. We're almost uh, close to um, uh, the top of the hour, but uh, I, I wanted to just uh, highlight one of the takeaways that you mentioned. Uh, and, it, it is, and it has to do with the fact that uh, some of these patients that are already established, that have had uh, the opportunity of receiving an anticoagulant, they come to the emergency room with a high INR, and all of a sudden everybody starts panicking and they want to revert it. So uh, that is a, a, um, a pearl of wisdom that uh, you reminded all the internists in the group, of course, uh, and, and uh, in your peers, that uh, they should be very careful when evaluating those patients that are currently in anticoagulation. And I think more importantly, if you agree, it will be to also allow the patient to understand uh, and empower them to know that uh, there is one thing called INR that you are going to incur in an increase. If that occurs, when you go to the emergency room, everybody's gonna panic. <laughs> so uh, that, that is uh, brilliant. I'm glad that you mentioned that. Uh, doctor, I wanted to just uh, uh, talk about something that uh, perhaps is, uh, is uh, in the works still. But 10 years ago, we were talking about uh, molecular genetics and, and the role that molecular genetics can actually play uh, in, the, um, in, in the hemostatic uh, type uh, action that is required in some of these conditions. Uh, I remember back in, let's say, 2015, 2014, uh, this was like in baby steps. The technology was not necessarily there. However, there were very robust studies uh, from the 80s as well, uh, where it, it talked about uh, utilizing or using, rather, a vector that can assist the hematologist, such as yourself, in understanding where the deficient uh, component is for us to tackle it. How do you feel about the new technology? How are we using this molecular genetics uh, currently in gene therapy? Yeah, so uh, yeah, the, uh, we could just talk for two hours just on that question, but no, we don't have no. that. <laughs> so the thing is that definitely uh, in some of the bleeding disorders, we are doing a lot of gene sequencing and everything because a lot of times it's tough to make a proper diagnosis so in, in hemophilias, in von Willebrand's, and even in platelet disorders, congenital, we do do uh, gene sequencing um, and uh, just to go and uh, confirm the diagnosis and have a proper diagnosis, which could also help family members. In thrombosis, we don't do much of genetic testing or gene because it really doesn't uh, uh, change the overall uh, management. Now, in terms of gene therapy, we have come a long way because the factor nine uh, for hemophilia B we already have uh, very good studies um, for factor IX uh, gene therapy. And then for factor eight also, we have gene therapies that are uh, there. So I think right now, even for factor nine, even with maybe one dose, um, uh, you can get uh, people who are having less than 1% to go to 30 to 40%, almost you're curing them uh, just with gene therapy. So except um, these are available right now and people can do it. Uh, of course, uh, it depends on the insurance um, approvals and other things. So factor nine gene therapy, factory gene therapy. So all these things have come a long way. Uh, so hemophilia B patients and hemophilia A patients are benefiting from that. So that's where we are. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. I know that uh, the Miami Cancer Institute uh, is also at the forefront of uh, gene therapy in, in many, many areas uh, that I know it's exciting 
to uh, your team and, and uh, the others as well, uh, especially the ones that deal with myelodysplastica syndrome type syndromes. Uh, we have two questions before I let you go, doctor, because yeah, yeah. Uh, we're almost closing. Uh, but uh, the first one uh, comes from Guatemala and uh, Maceli um, is uh, wondering, with the patient with factor five laden, do they have uh, to be anticoagulated for life? If yes, which is the best anticoagulant actually for them? Yeah. This is a great question in which we get uh, uh, in our clinic very commonly. And that's what takes me to that last slide, as I was saying, telling you that basically um, it doesn't matter because the treatment duration is decided based on is it a provoked or unprovoked? That's it. So if you have a factor five laden, but this was after a hip surgery or a knee replacement that you had a clot, I'm still only going to anticoagulate you for three months. You had bad COVID infection, and that's why you had a clot. Maybe three to six months, I stop. It doesn't matter whether you have factor five laden or not. And in unprovoked, it doesn't matter because I'm thinking of long term, but there are other things like D dimer I use. So, really, the factor five doesn't determine. It's the clinical presentation of is it provoked or unprovoked that really uh, determines the duration. But there are some unprovoked people, if you feel it's a strong homozygous factor five. Uh, it's a massive clot, then I may say, okay, let's continue. But mostly de it's determined by the clinical picture. Right, <clears throat> right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Avascal, for that question. And uh, the last question is, does anticoagulation affect lupus anticoagulation testing? Yes, it does affect, a uh, great question again. So it does affect lupus anticoagulant testing. So uh, basically, um, um, uh, the thing is that the lupus anticoagulant testing has two components a lot of times. So one is PTT, and then other is uh, basically, other is um, um, uh, the DRBVT. I'm just trying to quickly see if we can uh, get back to the, uh, sorry for the- uh, It's all right. Make you dizzy. But uh, so yes, <laughs> so the thing is that if you look at it, uh, basically, uh, there is one more test here that starts the reaction at factor 10 called the DRVVT, which is a dilute Russell Viper venom test. And then we do the PTT testing. So that you do two screens for lupus anticoagulant. One is mm -hmm. the PTT testing. Other is the dilute Russell Viper venom test, which starts the reaction at factor 10. So the PTT reagent, the activated, starts the reaction above factor 12. And the DRVVT, which is the dilute Russell Viper venom, it starts the reaction at factor 10. So what are your common anticoagulants? Let's say you have warfarin. Warfarin affects 2, 7, 9, 10. As I said, warfarin is going to affect your PTT and warfarin will affect your DRVVT. So it could be prolonged. What is your other things? Heparin. Heparin affects the PTT. And of course, heparin also affects the DRVVT because heparin acts at the level of factor 10, factor 10A through antithrombin. And it also affects the thrombin. So heparin affects it. Apixaban and rivaroxaban, they are direct 10A inhibitors. So they work on the 10A. And I told you the DRVVT starts the reaction here and the PTT has to go through these things. Right. So yes, they can be affected. So that is why I would not recommend doing the lupus anticoagulant test while you're on anticoagulants because people can misinterpret them sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there are ways to interpret it properly. But a lot of people, if you're not an expert, you can misinterpret. So I stick with just getting the anti-cardiolipin antibodies and anti-beta-2 glycoprotein antibodies. These are ELISA tests. They are not affected by anticoagulant. So you can just get those two components and don't get the lupus anticoagulant test. Okay, mm. I hope that's clear. Mm. That is definitely clear. And uh, again, as I said initially, I am so thrilled that <laughs> you can help us decipher uh, the ways to actually go in uh, these very convoluted uh, yet um, incredibly well-studied subjects. So we're so, so happy that you are in our benign clinic uh, in helping us with these referrals that come from abroad. Um, we are at the top of the hour and I'm gonna let you go, doctor. And on behalf of our international team, I would like to thank you once again for this incredible presentation, truly enjoyable.
and to all of today's participants uh, for your attendance. If you have additional questions for Dr. Nagawa, please uh, send it to us at uh, BAPT, uh, BHI webinars at baptisthealth.net. It's in your screen and you can contact us at the number that is presented in your screen and or uh, simply um, uh, call us and uh, pose your question or make your referrals if you wish uh, for Dr. Nagala. We look forward to seeing you at our next oncology lecture series. It's scheduled for Tuesday, September 20th, 2022. Thank you once again. Have a great summer and we'll see you again. Thank you so much, Dr. Nagala. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.